Yes, I finally finished the game. It has been two and a half years since Octopath Traveler was released, and I picked it up not too long after the release, along with a Switch to play it on. Essentially, I've owned an Octopath machine for two years, and I dreaded turning it on every time. At least there were the Bravely Default 2 demos to change it into a JRPG machine. Now, there are two main reasons why this game took me so long to beat, and hear me out on both. The first is, I couldn't play. I'd left my Switch back at home when I went to university. But the second reason is that even when I was home, be it for weekend visits or Christmas breaks, I had zero interest in picking up the game and playing it. Every time I turned on my Switch, it was immediately followed with a sigh of discontent. This was the single biggest mixed bag of a video game I have ever played, and I don't care much for mixed bags. Sure, there's usually stuff in there I enjoy, like candy-coated chocolates and nacho chips, but you can't ignore the overwhelmingly gross taste of coffee-flavored pretzels and baked soybeans that contaminates everything else. This game is the same way. There are things about Octopath I absolutely love, adore even. And then there's the baked soybeans that made it so hard for me to pick up this game and play. The only way I was able to make any kind of considerable progress was by playing through large bursts. It was basically like pushing a giant boulder. It was hard to start, but eventually the task got easier to persist in as you built up momentum and you just roll along with it. And then you take a break and don't want to start again the arduous process of getting back into the groove of things. So today, we're cracking open this trail mix. We are going to pick through Octopath Traveler and talk about what this game excels at and where it flops on its pretty, pretty face. We will go over how it compares to other titles I've played made by this game's creators and how I believe that one key trait permeates every major problem and success that this game has. And one last note before we get into this, there are going to be some spoilers regarding end games content and story points that are necessary to explain my points. But we will pick out all the awesome treats and then miserably chew our way through the rest. Because, as I've said, that's what Octopath is. The biggest and most heavily divided party mix of a game I've ever played. If you are new to the channel, a like and a sub would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Now then, in case you've somehow lived under a rock during 2018 and didn't see a single Nintendo Direct during that year, I'll give you a quick summary. Octopath Traveler is a turn-based JRPG released by Square Enix, made by the same main developers responsible for the Bravely Default series in July of 2018. The game's big gimmick was the fact that it featured eight different characters, each with their own stories for you to play through in any order you wished. The game features very unique visuals, with a HD pixel art style, incredibly detailed environments, and clean special effects during combat. This detail seems to be the biggest draw of interest for people, at least from various conversations I've had, and it certainly is one of the tastier parts of this party mix, so let's start there. This game is gorgeous, there's no denying that. From the glittering snowlands of the north to the majestic and relaxing coastlands with the rippling waters and brilliant sands, every outdoor environment has so much personality as you venture across or stare. This really makes the journeying aspect of Octopath have a lot more body to it compared to your typical JRPG, paired with some great background music to boot. Doing the overworld traveling this game to new towns actually feels like an adventure because of the real physical distance you have to go, and it's pretty enjoyable. The character designs are also great. Every little pixel person fits right into the art style of the world, and I love all the different outfits that come with each job you can equip, whether it makes them look badass like Warmaster Hanet or hilarious like Dancer Therian. 
On top of that, you have these breathtaking illustrations of each character in their status menus, and the map of Orstera itself is well designed, with every single detail actually meaning something and generally representing a physical location you can visit, such as hidden caves and job shrines and such. In combat, magic spells and various effects take the other route, moving away from traditional illustrations and pixel art to clean-cut ice shards and swirling flames. Combined with incredible sound design, and you get some really satisfying ability animations. And the boss designs? Ugh, just stunning. I won't show it to save the surprise for anyone who still wants to play the game, but the true final boss design is absolutely incredible, on par with or possibly better than Tree X Death from Final Fantasy V in my opinion. The last visual element I wanted to address is the game's user interface. The UI is extremely crisp and easy to read, as well as having a simple design that's just as easy to navigate. Who knew a black and white vertical list would work perfectly fine? I'm looking at you, Bravely Default 2. I tease because I love. Overall, I think everyone can agree that Octopath is an immaculate looking game, and while I would advise people to remember not to judge a book by its cover, Octopath certainly has a cover that is hard not to look at and love, and so I can't really judge if you want to play this game just from seeing the visuals alone. If you aren't swayed to play this game from its visuals, then perhaps its siren song will lull you in. Another one of Octopath's strong points, and probably my favorite of them all, the soundtrack is a masterpiece. This is Yasunori Nishiki's first major project, and I have to say, major props to the guy on this. There is not a single bad track in this game, and although I will slightly contradict this point in the review later for a specific reason, this part of the video is for praise. Every town theme captures the area's personality to a T, and the music of the outside world aids in giving your journey that proper, adventuring feel to it that I talked about earlier. There's so many earworms in this game, I can't even count them, and they're still wriggling around in my brain as I'm doing this review. And then there's certain town themes that will catch you off guard completely, either through sheer beauty or sudden despair. The first time that I heard Stolen Dreams Lost Light, I instantly knew that shit was going down in this chapter. Now, everybody loves it when a theme song plays. It's even better when you hear a character's theme song. So it's pretty freaking awesome when you get eight different themes that all kick total ass and have two versions each. These character themes are absolutely incredible, both the normal and pre-battle versions. My personal favorites were Ulbrich, Tressa, Alfin, and Primrose, but the other four were also really good. And what do I mean by pre-battle themes? Well, before each boss fight, you get to hear the theme of the character whose chapter you are doing while they confront the villain and proclaim how they will stop their evil doings. And then you get to listen as it beautifully transitions over to the boss theme as the fight begins. It's a fantastic touch that I really enjoyed. And don't even get me started on the combat themes. Dear God, every single combat song in this game is just phenomenal. All three of the normal combat themes that escalate and change as you progress into the later chapters really get you pumped to fight the enemy, and yet they are all different from each other. And the boss themes, it's just never-ending Christmas with this game. All of the boss themes really capture the intimidating yet hopeful mood of doing battle against these great foes. And again, like the normal battle themes, they only improve as you advance through the story, culminating in Battle at Journey's End, a wondrous song to have playing at the final conflict of your long journey. It is a song that accurately represents the accumulation of your travels and your struggles, and that this is the final battle to win before you have reached your destination. And then there's Daughter of the Dark God slash the one they call the Witch. For all the praises I just tossed onto Battle at Journey's End, I cannot even begin to describe how immaculate this final boss theme is. There are days where I debate with myself whether I like this more than Serpent Eating the Ground from Bravely Default, and to this day, 
I think they are powerful equals. This two-part absolute beast of a song is the perfect encapsulation of a battle at the end of the world. There is despair, there is fear, there is danger. And then there are moments of hope sprinkled in, moments where our eight heroes take their chance to raise their blades against the eponymous Dark God. And the transition theme between phases is just so nice. It's so good. And for those curious, I was unfortunately unable to defeat this final boss. I managed to get to the second phase, only to get immediately wiped on the first turn. But someday I will return to defeat Galbera, because the difficulty doesn't turn me away from trying. In fact, the very fact that it is so difficult, on top of amazing sprite art and having possibly the best, or tied for the best, final boss theme I've ever heard, makes me want to win. And that's the power of Octopath's soundtrack. It reaches into your very soul, in a sense, and lights a fire that drives you to fight until the very end. There's a reason I just sat here spitting out compliment after compliment for this music. It is that good. Even if you don't pick up the game, I highly recommend just sitting down and giving it a listen and immerse yourself in the sounds of Orstera. Alex Mukala recently made a great video talking about why the Octopath soundtrack works so well, and as someone with basically no musical knowledge, I really enjoyed the video. So definitely give that a watch after this review. I will put a link to the video in the description. In regards to actually playing the game, the combat aspect is probably the best part, and possibly the only good one. Like Bravely Default, Octopath takes the turn-based system and turns it on its head a bit with its own break and boost system. Here's a really quick rundown on how it works. First, let's go over the break system. In combat, enemies have these things called shield points. There are also a number of weaknesses every enemy has. Hitting an enemy with something they are weak to, either a weapon type or element, reveals the weakness permanently if it was not known beforehand and removes one shield point. When an enemy's shield points hit zero, the shield breaks, making that enemy more open to damage and leaving them stunned for the remainder of that turn and the entirety of the next turn. Boosting is the use of BP or battle points to increase the power of your actions. It's not quite like Bravely where you get extra actions based on how much BP you use, but the heightened power of a boosted action certainly shows. A character naturally gains 1 BP per turn, unless they have used any amount of BP on the previous turn. One thing that makes this system a bit nicer than Bravely's is that a character can hold up to 5 BP at a time instead of 3, meaning they have the ability to do all-out attacks with 3 BP two turns in a row instead of one typically if they get something restored through say an item or a separate ability. Or they are simply able to store up more BP than they use to conserve for later turns when it's needed most. At the top of the screen, turn order for both the current turn and the next are shown, allowing you to plan out your actions based on who is acting when and which enemies you should target first to reduce the enemy's threat level. I'm also a fan of the items in this game. Sure, the equipment is cool and all, and you can get some pretty neat weapons, but I just really like the flavor of making all the recovery items different kinds of fruits. Grapes for health, plums for MP, pomegranates for BP. I don't know, I just thought it was fun. In my honest opinion, I believe Octopath's combat system is more strategic than that of other JRPGs I've played. While definitely slower than others, the turn order bar alongside the break and boost system makes for fights that are both focused on being calculated and precise with your actions, as well as being satisfying to experience. Every shield break just feels like a million bucks, and then getting to unleash moves like Brand's Thunder or Balogar's Blade just feels incredible. And boss fights get even more interesting, for as you progress through the game, the bosses begin manipulating the rules of battle in strange and difficult ways. Some bosses will lock out certain weaknesses until you complete a certain objective. Others will block out turn order so you can't see. And some swap through multiple sets of weaknesses after having their shield broken. This makes for some excellent fights that add a new requirement for the player, outside of just using strategy. Adaptability. 
and since the combat is relatively slower, this gives the player the time they need to properly adapt, and possibly be able to pull through any fight without having to restart, even if it might have been easier with a different job or character they didn't bring into the fight. Sometimes there's instances where you do need a specific character or job, such as when I had to swap in a thief for fighting Ulbrich's final boss, but for the most part, you have a multitude of strategies available when attempting to defeat a boss. Speaking of jobs, I feel the class selection in Octopath is a nice, compact amount. There are eight base jobs, obviously, and then four secret jobs that can be obtained through optional bosses. All of the characters start with their base classes, of course, and then can be equipped with one of the other 11 later as you find the job shrines around the world. You can also only have one secondary job equipped to a person at a time, i.e. only one person can have the dancer secondary at a time, or the warrior secondary, etc. No two characters can have the same secondary class at a time, which I think was a smart move to try and maintain balance without being overwhelming. The abilities of each class are also fairly interesting, and they work well in supporting a form of flavor of the class from the angle that these jobs are self-sustaining for each of these journeyers on their travels. Some jobs felt very flavorful and made sense, such as warrior, hunter, and dancer, while some others seemed very strange yet were still good, such as the very utility-focused merchant. The method of unlocking job abilities is also well handled. Instead of progressing through a set order of new commands by hitting thresholds of job points, you instead spend those job points you earn per character on the abilities you want first, and then can get the other abilities later for higher costs as you unlock more of the class. Passive skills are also learned by unlocking more abilities within a single class, and super powerful divine skills, which can only be used by spending 3 BP in battle, can only be unlocked once you've learned all other abilities of a job. This level of unlock freedom was much appreciated, and is a system I personally believe should be made the standard of almost any video game genre with a progression system from now on. Of course, there are still builds that absolutely break this game. The moment I obtained Ruin Lord and put it on Tressa, the game became substantially easier in an instant. No joke, the secret jobs are insanely busted in this game, and their fights are relatively cheesable. All four are incredibly powerful, and I highly recommend obtaining them if you are planning to play or are currently playing Octopath and have not done so. And that's it. We've picked out all the goodies from this party mix. There might still be some stuff at the bottom of the bag or floating around the middle somewhere, but for the most part, I've gotten the good parts out of the way. So now let's transition from our last topic to one very much related to it, difficulty. While I said that Octopath's combat can be overcome with strategy and adaptiveness, its numbers game is a different beast entirely. Octopath has recommended levels for each chapter, and the way I played this game was by following this recommended level order from lowest to highest, completing each set of chapter 1s, 2s, 3s, and 4s before moving on to the next set, in the hopes of having a natural curve as I played. That was not the case. Octopath's difficulty curve is closer to a series of hard peaks and long plateaus, and this was bothersome. Take the chapter 3 set, for example, where upon starting, Alfin had the lowest recommended level of 31. So I go there and I naturally grind my party to be around or just above level 31 to have a fair and good boss fight. Only to have my ass absolutely blasted by the boss. Miguel was such an ass that I had to level my party far higher than the recommended level to even have a chance at beating him just because of the numbers game, and by the time my party was high enough to do so, now every other chapter in the set, save Therians, was incredibly easy because now half my characters were buff as hell and crushed each of the next four bosses without a problem. And then we hit Therion's chapter and ran right into the cliffside of another difficulty spike. 
If the recommended levels have such a natural curve to them, ranging between levels 31 to 39 for this set, then why were the spikes so high and weirdly placed? The chapter 1 set on the other side of the coin was incredibly easy, though in this case I understand why. They wanted to make it so you could start with any character you wished, therefore every single first chapter was at the difficulty level of a tutorial. Because that's what every chapter 1 in this game is. A tutorial. Enjoy that for the first 10 hours of this game, repeating tutorial after tutorial after tutorial and not having the game get any harder. Also, as a quick side note, why on God's green earth would they want you to spell out Octopath with the character order you play? I would never want to start with Ophelia and I'm glad I screwed up and picked Ulrich first because I'd much rather start the game by grabbing Warrior, Dancer, Apothecary, and Thief, as I did, instead of having a Cleric with only two damage types, Staff, and Light for my first fight, only to be followed by Scholar, who only has Staff as well for weapons, and then just adds the three basic Black Magic elements to the mix. In a game where exploiting weaknesses is crucial to combat, I would not want to have to rely on magic so early on for both breaking shields and doing the actual damage, as I can see myself running out of MP quick and having my squishy mages just fall over because I don't have enough inspiring plums at this point in the game to restore my MP. Having the weapon and magic mix available from starting with Ulbrich and Primrose, as well as the more natural party formation from continuing this way, makes a lot more sense. Also, whatever character you start with cannot be swapped out of the party until you complete their fourth chapter, so I'm really glad I wasn't stuck with Ophelia for about 90% of this game. Perhaps they wanted you to start by spelling Octopath to create the difficulty that was missing from these tutorial chapters, as I previously mentioned, but I believe in the long run, and probably at the beginning too, it would ruin your fun. The reason I go over this may be from a more personal perspective, but I prefer a consistent difficulty. Not simple, not too easy or too hard, but rather a gradual climb that challenges you fairly as equally as you grow. This inconsistency that stretches to both ends of the spectrum, however, was highly noticeable and made for moments of equal frustration when a boss suddenly seems way too difficult for the level that was recommended, or far too easy and gave no gratification for being a pushover. And while I may find this game's difficulty to be annoyingly inconsistent, the format of chapters are on the flip side in that they are ridiculously boring and repetitive. Save for a few examples I will mention shortly, every single chapter in Octopath follows the exact same routine. Enter a town, get your opening cutscene, run around town and use that character's path action, grind in the dungeon for two hours, fight the boss, get your ending cutscene, and repeat. This grew quite rough, repeating the same exact cycle over and over and over again. Only on a few occasions was the cycle broken, and when it was, it felt gloriously refreshing. But moments like that were few and far between. As a result, the only paths I can say I truly loved were Ulbricht's and Primrose's, with the former being the stronger of the two. Ulbricht's path did a lot of things well compared to the other stories. Sure, the first chapter followed this formula, but again, I cannot entirely fault it for this because that was a tutorial chapter. Chapter 2, however, broke the cycle immediately and introduced a tournament chapter where instead of level grinding and wandering through the dungeon for two hours, you instead fought a series of mini-bosses in an arena before facing the true boss of the chapter. Chapter 3 arguably had two bosses, one related directly to the events of the chapter at hand, and then a fight against the man Ulbrich has been looking for this entire time through using his path action. The moment that the window appeared on screen mid cutscene gave me goosebumps, and the following one on one challenge fight playing Ulbrich's theme throughout. In victory, truth! made me go, This! Why isn't there more of this in the other paths? Or perhaps Primrose's final chapter with a two phase boss fight where the first phase plays determination over top? 
Why weren't there more variations in chapter formatting like this? These are the moments we live for in JRPGs, in any kind of storytelling. These breaks in the story, these, dare I say it, subversions of expectations. And they should have been more common across all eight storylines. But instead, more often than not, the formatting is stagnant, unwilling to evolve or try something different, and instead sticks to this formula far too strongly. Just like the numerous crossroads our heroes encountered on their travels, there's a number of directions we can go from here. I'll just take the closest path and talk about dungeon design. Being the areas we probably spend the most time in, doing our level grinding and such, I would have hoped that the dungeons in Octopath were a bit more stimulating. That was not the case here. Octopath has four kinds of dungeons. Caves, forests, high-class buildings, and a few sewers here and there. And they all look the same. Forests were the worst offenders in this department. The other places at least made an attempt at looking different and succeeded occasionally. But forests were just the worst. There were times where I could literally not tell the difference between one forest and another because they looked exactly the same. At least the sewers, though similar, looked pretty cool and I actually liked going through them. Normally I might not have such a problem with this, but it's only a small part in the greater whole problem that was tedium. Whether or not the visuals were interesting, these dungeons are extraordinarily bland. They were one to two room mazes more often than not, with a few chests along the way. And not even that complex of a maze, mind you. No, these were just walk from entrance to boss dungeons, from point A to point B, with some chests scattered around here and there. I'm going to use an example from the Bravely series for comparison, both as a modern JRPG and because it was made by some of the same people who made Octopath. Geyser Grotto was a very cool dungeon introduced in Bravely Second. The dungeon had the very neat gimmick of every room applying a different effect to combat. For example, one room applied Berserk to all participants in battle, friend and foe. Another room greatly favored magic damage over physical, and so as you progressed, you had to constantly adapt in order to survive in this ever-changing environment. On top of that, there were a series of puzzles involving moving platforms to create bridges across the scalding hot geysers to access different areas, as well as having chests here and there too. Whether you found Geyser Grotto to be annoying or not, this is top-notch creative dungeon design. Octopath doesn't have anything remotely close to this. Again, you just wander along the most obvious path until you eventually end up at the boss. Why didn't they have dungeons that block certain weaknesses from being exploited? What about a really dark dungeon that blocks your turn order from being seen? Sure, it might be annoying, but it would certainly keep the place from being stale. Just give me something, anything. Now some of you might be saying, hey wait a minute, Final Fantasy did the same exact thing of mazes and chests and you're not criticizing what they did? While that is true, Final Fantasy dungeons are also usually longer than most Octopath dungeons, giving you an actual sense of exploration to the places you go. And that point aside, Octopath Traveler is from 2018. I would hope that games have evolved since prior days of JRPG dungeons instead of using outdated mechanics. God, even Bravely Default 2 is moving away from set random encounters to avoidable encounters, so why do we have set encounters in this game? There were even chances for Octopath to do something more interesting, and they just chose not to. For the multiple chapters that take place on the coastlands, none of their dungeons feel like you're on the coast. Have a dungeon that's just a beach, where you have to wander between sandbars in the afternoon sun and wade through shallow water for hidden chests. You could have the remains of wrecked ships stretching the shoreline, and, and, no, it's just caves again. The overworld looks gorgeous and more unique in each location, so why can't the dungeons have that kind of change and variance? So the only things you have to do in these dungeons is find the end, which is easy, open some chests along the way, and level grind. And as well designed as the combat is, anything can become boring in excess, including the combat. Level grinding became a chore, and for as good as the music is in Octopath, eventually I just got so fucking sick of listening to these themes ad nauseum. 
That's because one of my biggest grievances with Octopath is its inability to distract me from the fact that I'm playing a JRPG. By this I mean Octopath doesn't draw me in enough to either not care or forget about the fact that I'm just running in circles around the same area trying to make my numbers bigger than the boss's numbers. Enrapture me with story, with gameplay, and with clever dungeons designed to make me think while I do so, yeah? Be a good JRPG and do that. But no, instead I was recognizing the tedium of what I was doing because there was nothing to keep me from thinking about it. I've saved this section for near the end since there is going to be some story talk, which means spoilers. Opinions on Octopath's story seem to vary from loving it to hating it, and I'd say I'm more towards the latter. Not all the way there, but almost. The stories of each character are all separate from one another, but are loosely tied together through a plot involving Lyblack, Graham Crossford, and the fallen god Galdera. Oh hey, I found one more of the good candies. I found the lore of Octopath to be incredibly interesting. The entire story behind the scenes about the witch and her attempts to resurrect her forbidden father from the gate of Finnis and how she went about doing so was just so fascinating to learn about. Too bad that's not what the majority of the game is about. The eight travelers stories unfortunately are only loosely tied together at their ends to this grand overarching plot and that's it. You'd think if they were going to promote the eight separate stories angle this hard they would have done a better job at writing them. That may seem a bit mean, but I was seriously let down by some of these storylines. Some of them were really good, like Albrecht's quest in hunting down his former partner in arms, Erhard, the man who betrayed their kingdom and murdered their king to find his own redemption as well as a reason to wield his blade. It was a little cliche, sure, but I think it was handled excellently. As well, Ulbrich meets Earhart in Chapter 3 instead of 4, which allows for another whole chapter of resolution, and made it feel much more appropriate and less rushed than the ending of, say, Therion's story. Primrose's was also quite good, especially because it was the other chapter that used gameplay to tell some of its story and mixed up the chapter cycle, though only for the conclusion. Again, these stories were either boring in and of themselves, or were just told in a boring manner. The worst defenders for me were Alfin, Tressa, and Ophelia. Alfin got off a little bit better here because his story actually made me think occasionally, like in chapter 3 where they discuss the matter of what lives are worth saving and whether you should heal an injured thief or not. Those were good questions to ask to make the player think and apply that logic to the real world and look at things in a different light. But his overall story fell into the Wanderer's Pitfall. Most of the Octopath cast has goals they want to achieve. Cyrus wants to find the lost book. Hanet wants to kill Red Eye and save her master, etc, etc. Tressa and Alfin both had the problem of just wanting to travel the world and do their jobs. This turns their plot lines more into episodes of Pokemon. Sure, Ash Ketchum is trying to beat the gyms and become a Pokemon master, but the majority of the episodes are about his various exploits as he travels whatever region he's in. That's what these plot lines were, essentially. Ophelia is arguably one or even two steps worse because not only does her story devolve into this basic format, but she also has a goal for her story, and probably the closest tie into the Galdera backstory of all the characters. Instead, her story is swept to the side as she just kinda helps random people in each town she visits, until her final chapter where she's actually confronted with a situation that directly affects the Galdera plot. But that amount of importance feels weaker because her story hasn't been about someone trying to corrupt the First Flame or Galdera or any of that stuff. The story that explains the background lore the most pushes all that aside so we can deal with some stupid kids in Saintsbridge. Ugh. As for the ending revelations in each story of how they were connected to the lore all along, they feel a bit tacked on. Again, Tressa and Alfin seem rather indirectly related to the situation, and where Ophelia should have been more involved in things that involve the gods, she's not. Speaking of connections, this game cannot make up its mind whether the party is actually together or not. Take Primrose's third chapter, for example. At the end of the chapter, after beating the boss, 
the very obvious old friend Simeon who is introduced in this chapter reappears and stabs Primrose, revealing himself as the final crow she's been looking for, and he leaves her to die. And for a moment, I was like, holy shit, how is Primrose going to get out of this one? And then the next moment I remembered, oh wait, weren't there like seven other people here with me, you know, on this journey, or at the least three others during the boss fight? And that was the moment my suspension of disbelief was completely broken. Now, some of you might argue that the other party members simply exist for solely combat reasons, not story purposes, because otherwise every boss would be like Ulbricht's third chapter. But the problem with this is that there are party chats between the members during the chapter, where they comment on events that are happening in the chapter. So are they there or not? It it feels like as if you're playing D&D and the DM only pretended that one player existed at any given time and only focused on their story and roleplay, but also wanted the rest of the party to join in for combat. I am aware that the game was presented as being eight separate journeys, but then why also have them interact through party chats if that was the case? I'm not saying I didn't enjoy the party chats, some of them were quite entertaining actually. What I am saying is that these two ideas don't match up. It just makes the fact that they aren't supposed to be connected feel even more half-assed to me. The separate journeys argument just completely destroys the integrity of the party interactions in Octopath for me. And for a final note, since this is the method of how the story is presented, the cutscenes are inconsistent in this game. Sometimes you get a fully voice acted cutscene, other times you get the partially voice acted cutscene, you know, with grunts and groans and exclamations like, hm, huh, or oh, and then sometimes it just decides to do both, with no clear cue or transition from one to the other in the middle of the scene. The voice acting is also hit or miss, with some performances being really freaking good, and some being... Han it. Listen, I love that this game tries to introduce different dialects and accents for people from different regions of Orstera. I think that's a really, really cool way of doing world building. But some of the accents are grating and gave me a headache to listen to after a while. Like Hannett's weird Shakespearean lines. Her performance was fine, but the wording was not. Letting my arrow fly in true. Also, despite having voice audio to max volume and music below it, I found there were times where the voice actors could not be heard over the music, either from the song being too loud or from the voice actor almost mumbling their lines. As well, I was greatly disappointed upon completing Ophelia's path, only to learn that the other paths did not have any conversations during their final fights. That was a great detail in Ophelia's last battle. Why not do it in the others? Therion sort of did it, except again, it was half-assed and not fully voice acted. When I first started having problems with Octopath Traveler, I began to worry. I started wondering if I didn't actually like the JRPG genre, and if I just happened to like Bravely Default. That worry was quelled when I played Final Fantasy 4 and 5 on stream and realized, oh, I do like JRPGs, I just don't like Octopath. Now, there is one word that has been searing in my mind throughout this entire review, ever since I started thinking about what could be the biggest contributor to all of my problems with Octopath. And I think I have it. Ambition. If you were to ask me to accurately sum up this game in as few words as possible, I would say that Octopath Traveler is overly ambitious. There's a lot of really good ideas here that unfortunately collapse onto one another under their own weight. And from there, the product just as a whole falls apart for me. And I don't take joy in talking poorly about Octopath. I really don't. I really wanted to love this game, but the problems were just too much for me to overlook. And so we come back full circle to why it took me so long to finish this game. Because Octopath never made me want to actively play it. Only when I got that boulder rolling did I want to keep it rolling, and that's how I got it done. So why am I so critical of this game? Why am I picking it apart so thoroughly when I could just say, shit game, 0 out of 10, don't play, or as mediocre as they come, 4 out of 10, not worth? Well, three reasons. A, because that's not good criticism. 
B, because Bravely Default 2 is coming around the corner very shortly, and I've noticed a good number of traits carried over from Octopath into that game based on it playing its demos. And C, because I want Team Asano and that whole crew to improve. They have made my favorite game series of all time, and when they try something new, I want to tell them what I thought worked and what didn't. Now my hopes are that they made Bravely Default 2 with the pros of what people liked about Bravely in mind instead of what Octopath did right, because I fear it's the reverse of that. And at the end of the day, I believe that Octopath Traveler is an incredibly mixed bag that can serve as an excellent learning experience. Of course, this is just one dude's opinion on the internet. I know people who loved Octopath's story or disliked the combat for being too slow, and that's fine. These are just my thoughts at the end of my very long, long journey. And now, I can rest. Thank you very much for watching. This review took a long time to get done, and I appreciate you for sitting through it and watching all the way to the end. So just thank you. Make sure to like and subscribe, share the video around if you agree. Let me know what you thought of it in the comments below. Do you agree with my points, disagree? Maybe we agree on some and disagree on others. Please share your thoughts in the comments. I would love to read them. Thank you very much for watching. Have a lovely day and I will see you soon.